Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the special board meeting on May 10th, 2021. Um, if I, I'd like to call the special board meeting to order. Mrs. Gober, can we have the roll call, please? Mr. Alozzi? Here. Dr. Beck Cooley? Here. Dr. Donaher? <laughs> Mr. Nyman? Mrs. Patrick? Here. Mrs. Schenkel? Dr. Shively? Here. Mrs. Sinkler? Mr. Fashionetto? Here. There are five members present. Thank you. If you could please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, if you could please join me for a moment of silent meditation. I would also like to uh, pass on the information that Russell D'Antrone passed away last Wednesday, May 5th. He served on the BASD Authority and the Bethlehem Area Votech Authority since 2011. Please keep Russ's family in your prayers and thoughts. Thank you. At this time, we will have courtesy of the floor for agenda items only. Please come up to the podium and state your name and address for the record. Anyone at home who's watching via Zoom can type in your question into the chat box or raise your hand to speak. There will also be a second courtesy of the floor at the end of the meeting. Okay, seeing no, um, no speakers at this time. Um, we're going to go in. We have no um, regular or special board meeting minutes to approve. Um, Mr. Fastnetto is not here for the president's communication. Dr. Roy, do we have any superintendent's report? Uh, not tonight. Okay. Is there any unfinished business before the board? Okay. Um, Next up, we have the recommendation of the administration 7.01, adoption of the 2021-22 proposed BASD budget. May I have a motion for item 7.01? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Shively. May I have a second? Second, Alozi. Thank you, Mr. Alozi. Any discussion or changes to, um, I'm sorry, any discussion on this topic? If I could just give a little context and review, and can we um, have the record show that Mrs. Schenkel is joining the meeting now? I said that because we're so spread out that you might not see it. Uh, so, um, yeah, so just for the board members before you vote, th just a couple of uh, reminders. This is the um, proposed final budget. So, under the law, we have to approve a, a proposed general fund budget a month before you vote on the final budget. And so, um, and you're really approving the expenditures, the, the number, the dollar amount of expenditures uh, in this um, proposed budget. Things will change between now and June. You know, the state government, we might have a state budget. Um, this budget assumes no change in the basic education subsidy or the special ed either or some special ed some special ed um, so there could be additional revenue um, from the state for example um, so there will be changes until uh, the end I want to remind the board that in January when we first presented the preliminary budget the our this we came in with a very tight conservative budget with expenditure increases of only two around around 2.3 percent, less than three percent, um, and that was a very tight. So that's that includes you know salaries, healthcare, all of our educational expenses, and so forth. 
Um, and we've maintained that tight <laughs> budget going through. But what changed was the federal stimulus or what we call the ESSER money that came through for the federal government that becomes part of the general uh, operating budget. But what's important to remember is that's, you know, uh, you put it on revenue on one side and expenditure as the other. So it cancels out. So um, it increases our total expenditure number because we're putting in those ESSER, that ESSER money, but it's in uh, um, revenue and expenditure. Uh, so it levels out. So this is a very, very tight budget uh, when we started. Despite that, we still have a $7.7 .7 million gap between our anticipated revenues and the proposed expenditures. So um, we still have time to make the final decision on how to close that. That's not the decision tonight. The decision tonight is really approving uh, this budget and the total expenditures. We can, we'll make adjustments going forward. I'm proposing, uh, I'm recommending to the board that in the end, assuming we get no additional state funding, that we split the difference on that $7.7 .7 million gap uh, and split the difference between a uh, 2% millage hike increase and a uh, and then taking 3.8 million from the fund balance so that would be that would um, generate um, the 7.7 .7 million that we need to close the gap any increase in state funding and there is some hope for that um, would would um, help close the gap and reduce um, the uh, millage increase or and or how much we need to take from the fund balance. So that's kind of the, I don't know, the parameters of the field that we're playing on at this point with the budget. Um, we were asked uh, at, the, at a prior meeting of the board um, to um, come up with some estimates of the, what's the average tax increase um, for the, I should say for the median, for the median valued home uh, and for a 2% tax increase, it is $89.32, to be precise, because Mrs. Gober would want me to be precise. <laughs> um, and, the, and that's Northampton County. And remember, two counties, one has reassessed, different millages, millage rates. In Lehigh County, a, uh, a total 2% uh, average district-wide would be a $28.34 average uh, bill increase. So Northampton County, $89.32 for the year at a 2% increase. And Lehigh County, $28 per uh, property, uh, $28.34. And then, um, you know, we can go higher than that and we can go lower than that, but that's, um, that's where we are and the board has that information. Any question for me on that? I just wanted to add just to follow up about those federal funds. There's been a lot of confusion about how we can slot those. And as you said, they're sort of coming in and going out. We discussed in our earlier budget meetings, those are for one-time expenditures. And even we got instruction from the state to explicitly do that. And so just to pass that information on to parents, I was talking with um, Ms. Gober before the meeting and we'll make that letter that we received from the state available on the BASD Proud Parents page. So it's clear sort of how we're doing our thinking around our budget, even with those federal dollars coming in, just so people can understand how those are sort of part of this conversation, but very much set aside from this conversation at the same time. Any other questions or comments on this? Okay, seeing none, Mrs. Gober, may we have a roll call vote for 7.01. Mrs. Schenkel? Yes. Dr. Shively? Yes. Mr. Alozzi? Yes. Dr. Beck Cooley? Yes. Mr. Fashionetto? Yes. Mrs. Patrick? Yes. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. 
I'm not seeing any new or mis miscellaneous business at this time. Uh, we'll have the courtesy of the floor now. Uh, anyone in the audience wishing to speak on any item may come to the podium. Uh, please state your name and address. Or for those at home on Zoom, please feel free to raise your hand or type in a question. And not seeing anything, uh, we'll move on. Are there any items for open forum for the board? Okay, I would just like to add a big thank you to Mrs. Bachman and her IT department team for setting all of this up. This is amazing, very safe and very effective. So thank you so much for all your hard work and for the work of your team. Okay, seeing nothing else, may I have a motion to adjourn this special meeting? So moved. Second. Mr. Losey, thank you. Second, Dr. Shively. Thank you so much. We're gonna roll right now into the board facilities committee meeting. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, welcome to our facilities committee meeting. Uh, we can start with a courtesy of the floor for agenda items only. I if anyone has comments or you want to add your, your comments to the chat or the Q&A box. If there are any online, let me know, but I don't see anyone here in front of us. So with that, we'll go on to our discussion items. First one is 2.01, an energy update. Thank you very much. We're gonna, we have no energy update for the evening. And so I'm gonna just step aside and we can turn it over to the next item. <laughs> All right, so then we can go right on to 2.02, .02, um, the PFM update, the 2011 general obligation bond. Um, our, we got a preview of this last month, but now we'll get the update. <laughs> All right, well, good evening. Uh, good to be back here in person. I'll just be real brief this morning. So up on the screen, um, we do have kind of the one page handout. If you could go to the next page, please. This is basically just a follow-up uh, from our meeting about three weeks ago. Uh, where we sort of updated the board with the refinancing opportunity, looking at one of your uh, uh, bond issues that's currently outstanding and we're approaching the call date or the date that we're legally allowed to refinance it. So we wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Uh, this evening, again, is just another update. And if all goes well, then your bond council would be here in two weeks um, for the actual resolution. But just to kind of recap the opportunity again, kind of first starting with the market update, uh, you know, overall, the interest rate market looks, you know, very good. Uh, we basically hit sort of all-time lows sort of right before the pandemic, uh, and then rates have kind of went up quite a bit after that and settled back down. So more or less, we're kind of at the same levels that we saw right before the pandemic, which are kind of very attractive to be considering this kind of, uh, this kind of refinancing. So from an interest rate perspective, things look good. The actual transaction itself, uh, what we're uh, looking to do is to refinance the series of 2011 bonds. And when we talk about refinancing, we just basically mean going from a higher rate to a lower rate, keeping the same structure of the debt and just achieving those economic savings by replacing a higher rate with a, with a lower rate. Again, no change to the actual amortization of the existing bonds. And so here in the middle of the page, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, what I'll call columns one and two, that's just kind of a real... Um, brief summary of the 2011 bonds, about $33 million outstanding on those bonds. The call date is November 15th of this year, which seems like it's kind of far away, but when we back into sort of the guidelines that were allowed or the legal requirements um, by the federal government, we're kind of at that point right now to start beginning uh, all the paperwork. The average rate on those bonds uh, is just a little under 4%, so it's still a good rate when they were issued in 2011. Uh, which is now considerably lower based on today's economic conditions. And again, the final maturity date is 2029, so a relatively short transaction, and we're going to keep that same end date as well. We're not going to extend it. Um, right now, right below there, uh, and number two, uh, point number two, uh, with our estimated interest rates at the moment, we're showing about 2.5 million of net savings. From a percentage standpoint or an efficiency standpoint, you may have heard me talk over the years about um, you know, if a refunding 
nets, say 2% of the amount where we're funding or 3% of the amount where we're funding, that's very good. Here, we're more than double that right now. But again, keeping in mind, these are just estimates until we're actually able to, to lock in, in the rates. Uh, and so right now, then on the right-hand side, the way those savings translate in column six in the yellow, uh, a little bit in the 21-22 year, about 175,000. And then basically the bulk of the savings would occur in the 22-23 year and the 23-24 year. And then after that, the basically the debt service would be more or less exactly what it is right now on, on those respective bonds. One thing that you know, I, did, I think I mentioned it briefly at our meeting last month, just to kind of give everyone a heads up, um, for the resolution, the bond resolution that would be considered on the 24th of this month, typically we like to put in there a savings floor that we cannot move forward with the transaction if the savings are below X amount. Um, you know, I think traditionally we have talked about 2% savings. Um, we still think that's very worthwhile to move forward with the transaction even at 2%. You know, obviously, we're going to get what the market bears. We're going to go through a competitive process to make sure that the district gets the you know the most advantageous rates. But I think from a uh, kind of the, a prudency standpoint, um, a general rule of thumb again is as long as the savings are um, the net savings are north of two percent, that would give us the ability to to move forward. Um, if we see the market look a little shaky at the time, we're ready to price it. We just postpone it, push it off a week or two weeks or however long we need until things settle down. But again, we kind of like to have that floor in, in the resolution. So that's something that I would like to be able to tell bond council to include in the in the resolution for your consideration for the May 20, May 24th meeting. But again, right now, we're well above that. We don't see anything in the near term horizon that would lead to sustained higher interest rates. I think we're going to continue to see the volatility ups and downs on a daily basis. But long term, um, you know, over the next couple of months, I, I don't, I don't see anything again really drastically changing. But obviously, we're going to be in touch with your administration closely here. Um, you know, for the duration of this transaction. So if we do see anything change, we'll we'll let everyone know. And then from a timing standpoint, if you could just scroll up a couple inches, the last section that I just wanted to go over from a timing standpoint. Again, here we are this evening just for an update. Um, May twenty fourth, your bond council will be here to review the parameters resolution and then a lot of work that we need to do along with your administration kind of later in May and through June to get all the paperwork ready. We'd like to have uh, the uh, competitive sale, you know, probably sometime early, early July. We just need to kind of figure out between a July 4th holiday uh, when investors are going to be um, kind of prepared and, and ready to, to act on, on that sale. So it may fluctuate a little bit uh, again, just based on that holiday. And then we would close at the earliest possible date we're allowed to, which is August 17th, and then call the bond. So kind of a lot of work to, to do here in the next couple of months. But what we're putting before you is basically the most proactive timeline possible. Uh, we can always, like I said, slow it down or put it on the shelf. If you see the market not cooperating, and that resolution will give us that flexibility to, to be able to do that. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, what are interest rates right, like right now? I know you can't like give anything solid, but I actually don't know. So. Yeah, well, the great great question. Um, when we uh, had the handout from the April meeting, we kind of condensed this one a little bit. We were assuming interest rates. Uh, it looked like about a one point seven five percent. So again, very very low. Um, so we're more or less going from about a three point eight five percent down to about a 1.75 based on those estimates. So a substantial drop uh, with that amount of money. That's what's generating those amount of savings. Any other questions or thoughts? If there are any other questions, thank you very much. And um, board members, you'll see that that's slated for the next um, full board meeting. It's 4.09 um, on the agenda under the um, under facilities. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. That's good news. Uh, Thank you, Scott. The only other discussion item we have is 2.03, Moravian College Aquatics Partnership.
All right, well, thank you very much again. So this is a, a partnership that's been uh, brewing for a year and a half now, uh, athletic departments at uh, our high schools and the college, looking at ways that uh, we could explore this partnership uh, that one allows Moravian to uh, begin a, a collegiate swim program, but then two also preserve uh, the programs at Liberty um, and those we support in the community in our pool for, for many, many years, and uh, we can coexist together. So uh, using uh, our lease policy as a framework for the partnership um, to outline uh, how this would work is a little bit different than just a standard lease, little, little cozy relationship than just running a basketball court. So uh, we developed a, an MOU we'll see later this evening that outlines some of uh, how that uh, work between the, uh, the ADs uh, panned out in terms of preserving our own athletic programs, our, our academic programs, um, our community programs with the Special Olympics, and our um, community athletics with the YMCA. So uh, we'll be able to preserve all those and schedule use of the pool with Moravian um, using our lease policy as the a guidance in terms of a cost. Uh, there's a cost in there, about $10,000 per year. Uh, in addition, the, the college is looking to uh, purchase new blocks, starting blocks for the, for the eight-lane pool. Uh, there'll be some co-branding in the, in the natatorium at Liberty. Um, just to recognize the partnership with Moravian, um, there could be some St. Luke signage in there as well, I understand. Um, but we want to preserve our Tuesday nights, the Special Olympics, uh, the YMCA use um, in the winter, concurrent to our um, our swim programs and as well as our, our gym classes uh, during the day. So uh, there's a lot of other things in the lease there, like details in terms of you know clearances for the athletes, and uh, we're separating locker room usage, things like that, to keep things as safe as possible. But uh, given the the parameters, the uh, requirements. We all believe it can, it can work out. If I could just add to, you know, um, Moravian added the swimming um, as a way to ex expand their athletic programs. Um, so our guideline was, as Mark kind of highlighted there, um, that not to displace any of our partners that are in there, Special Olympics, the Y, our own programs, our our gym classes, swimming gym classes, although students would probably advocate that would be okay. Um, but uh, so, uh, you know, not that, you know, we wouldn't have the Moravian swimmers um, coming and going, you know, you know, coming as our swimmers are leaving at night. They'll probably mostly practice at night or really early in the morning. Um, there's a time frame actually between when we're in early in the morning and school starts. <laughs> Um, so, um, so that was all, those were the parameters that we, you know, we can fit it in college kids. They'll be flexible. If they have to come in at 10 o'clock at night to practice. They'll do that. Um, but we won't disrupt the programs and our swim coach, um, was involved in the discussions and understands and, and is on board with making that work. And it's a good way for us to partner with our partner Moravian when they need us, um, because they don't have these facilities. Our our pool facility at Liberty is, is uh, as good as many or better than many division three uh, college teams. So it's a plus for Moravian and it's a way for us to, you know, uh, help out our partner. Any other questions about this? So that will also be on the agenda. It's 4.01. That, are there any other discussion items? beyond those that are on the agenda. Yeah, oh, sorry, no, Mr. Just, just a quick question. The um, items that are donated in kind, um, the start, the, the diving blocks or starting blocks, I don't quite remember, um, and now that's on there. Those are permanent fixtures, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Sounds like we're getting a pretty good deal out of this, just throwing it up there. Sorry, any other questions? I'll look around. Any other discussion items additional to the agenda? No more discussion items, nope. All right, then we can go on to our information items, 3.01, the summer 2021 projects. This is just the uh, ongoing update of our uh, 
our projects planned for this summer. So can happy to report that work at Farmersville began on Friday night and they are back in force uh, this evening. So that's underway. Looking forward to that getting uh, up to full speed. Uh, we have our projects at the, the bus garage and transportation and the uh, Colonial Early Learning Center. Uh, we have pre-construction meetings scheduled for week after next to get those kicked off. And we will be uh, opening bids on the rebid for the Brockle Middle School parking deck uh, this Wednesday. So we are hoping to, uh, you know, pending some favorable results there, hoping to uh, bring back an agenda item at the HR committee next Monday to review those results. Mr. Stein, can, I don't know if it's just me, but could you get a little closer to the microphone or speak a little louder? Oh, sure, With the no mask, problem. it's just hard to pick it up. Thank you. Any questions about summer projects? The season has already begun. <laughs> All right, then with that, we can go to the agenda items. Um, we heard about 4.01, that's the Moravian College Aquatics Partnership. Uh, 4.02 is the federal contracting requirement for HVAC renovations. That's at Farmersville. There's a change order. Yes, ma'am. There'll be uh, a couple of change orders, actually, one for each contractor, uh, the two prime contracts. So this goes back to our conversation uh, over the last several months about using federal funds to pay for the Farmersville project. Uh, because it was awarded just as that money was coming to the table, uh, there are a few uh, changes we have to make to the contract to make it compliant with the federal uniform guidance uh, for being able to spend the money on the project. So in consultation with our solicitor, um, we were developed some change orders uh, with uh, Reef's team's help as well. Um, so those change orders are there to make that project uh, once approved, federally compliant, allowing us to use the uh, the ESSER funds um, for that project. Any questions about that? All right, then 4.03, we have masonry repairs at Northeast Middle School, uh, another deductive change order. This goes back to last summer. Uh, one of last summer's projects, so just closing this out with the deducted change for uh, nearly $4,000 back into the coffers. Then we got 4.04, .04, Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency Pandemic Disaster Relief Grant. So at the onset of the uh, pandemic, uh, this I guess the feds through the state made available grant monies uh, for uh, mitigation uh, actions uh, as a result of the pandemic. So we are looking to pursue these funds uh, for uh, expenses incurred a year ago when we resumed construction at Asa Packer and Spring Garden. So we're looking to uh, recoup those, those funds. It's about $20, $24,000 worth, $23,000 worth. Um, through this Pima grant, and this is the application to kick that off. Any questions about that? 4.05 is the district-wide security management system maintenance and support services agreement. I'm gonna excuse myself for this conversation. Um, this is uh, with my the company I work with. So I just feel it would be appropriate for me to step out. So if you wanna just text me, I'll step back. Perfect. Thank you. So there's nothing anyone said, I guess is what she's saying. So, all right. <laughs> Are there any details about 4.05? Uh, sure, this is a, a continuation for the last three years of services uh, we procured to uh, uh, maintain and manage our district-wide security management platform in terms of our access control with card readers and security cameras at uh, all of our schools. Any questions about that? All right, let me just tell Emily she's clear. So 
sorry. I think everyone just got it. My apologies, but it's as quick as I could get her back in here. Um, all right. Uh, that brings us to 4.06. Um, emergency transportation services. This is a, uh, I guess, a standard for uh, uh, charter schools that are looking for our support in the event of emergency if they have to evacuate their building. Uh, an agreement that just says we will, uh, we will provide busing uh, to shelter or transport children from their building to somewhere else, and then they will uh, reimburse us for those costs. Any questions about that? All right, 4.07, North Star Network Telephone Maintenance and Support Services Agreement. Um, this is a uh, agreement for our telephone system and the vendor that has provided support for us. Renewal. Any questions about that renewal? All right, then we have 4.08, trash removal, recycling services through Colonial Intermediate Unit 20, joint purchasing bid. The IU is out to bid right now for trash services for us right now. So our uh, refuse and recycling, uh, that bid opening is on Wednesday. So just to put that on as a placeholder for now, uh, we'll review those results and uh, have those numbers filled in for the board meeting. Have they been our vendor for this service for the for a while now, or is this a new contract? Uh, it's an existing contract. The IU does the contracting for it because they're supporting multiple districts throughout the county. Uh, they're simply the procurement agent, if you will. Um, right now, you know, we have a, a uh, advanced disposal as our current vendor, and their existing three-year contract uh, is up here at the end of the school year. So for clarification, we allow the IU to find someone to do that for us. Correct. All right, cool beans. Thank you. Any other questions? The only other item we have is 4.09. That's the general obligation bond parameters resolution, which we uh, discussed uh, just earlier. So with that, we were, yes, do you have a question about um, that one? I actually had a quick question back on item um, 406, if that's all right. Sure. Thank you. So that memorandum, basically the charter arts, if they for any reason need to evacuate their school, we would provide transportation, but then they have to reimburse us regardless of whether the reason was, you know, a scare called into the police or an actual gas leak or something like that. Is that the way I'm reading it? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So if we're available, we can, you know, call our emergency drivers in. We would provide a vehicle to help them out or several vehicles, as the case may be, and they would be billed for the service. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Any other questions? That bring up, brings us back to courtesy of the floor. This could be about any item you would just speak with the board about here, or if you're listening through Zoom, chat, Q&A, that someone is watching, if we have anybody in there. Nope. All right, open forum, board members, any items? All right, with that, we adjourn. We have to formally do that, but we um, adjourn facilities and we'll roll into the curriculum committee meeting. I don't know if you want a minute or two, Ms. Patrick. All right, no breaks. We'll roll right in. Okay. Okay. Welcome to the board curriculum committee meeting for May 10th, 2021. As always, we have courtesy of the floor for agenda items only. If you're online, feel free to put it in the Q&A box or raise your hand. Not seeing anything. Um, 
Dr. Silva, do we have any discussion items tonight? Uh, no discussion items, Mrs. Patrick. Okay, then we're gonna head right into information items. We have 3.01 educational program delivery in 2021-2022. Yes, as we know, 2021 was a challenging year of pandemic related education, but we're heartened to see this afternoon, we have uh, the vaccination clinics over at Liberty and Freedom. So 16 year olds are now eligible. And if you haven't seen the newspaper update just today, it appears the CDC has approved for the Pfizer vaccine for children as young as 12 for emergency. So things are definitely looking up in terms of both uh, uh, vaccinations and the success of the mitigation that we've had at the elementary level since uh, the spring break. So I know Dr. Roy sees the uh, dashboard every day going up and down, but the general trend is down. And we're hopeful that that continues for the rest of this school year and allows us to do the planning for the 2021-2022 school year, where our goal is to ret return students to school five days a week. So uh, at the elementary level, we're seeing quite a lot of success with four days a week right now. So with proper mitigation, uh, we're in uh, intending for them to be five days. Our principals will be contacting these parents whose children are currently in the completely virtual e classroom at the elementary level, informing them of the plan for next year's return and, ha and uh, handling any specific um, exceptions on a case by case basis. But school will look like school if all things go according to plan this summer. Likewise, at the secondary level this year where we've had hybrid the entire time and where uh, teachers were responsible for the caseload of their virtual students on their roster. Uh, again, we would be back full time next year uh, with full mitigation. And uh, we of course have our BASD Cyber Academy for those students who uh, want that virtual option. And in our master schedule at Liberty and Freedom, we are adding some hybrid courses just because they're good courses and provide flexibility for students to take different, different uh, offerings at different locations. So we're trying to make sure we incorporate the best of the pandemic learning, uh, but also restore the best of what we know is teaching and learning under the best circumstances, which is students and teachers together in a classroom. That's the best news I've heard all day, Dr. Silva, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments on this wonderful news? Dr. Beck Cooley? I know. Um, just curious if there was any plan to keep any e-classroom version at the elementary level in the fall, or if the idea is complete. I, I agree, this is amazing, amazing, amazing news. I just wanted to yeah. clarify that. <clears throat> Not as a structured option, like the way we discussed it at the beginning of this year with basically asking parents, hey, how do you, how do you want it? Do you have the, so school is in person next year. And in the conversations between the principals and the parents of those e-learners, if there's any exceptions that we need to make, those will be handed on, handled on a very thoughtful case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Alozzi? I just, I just wanna say, I think it's important for the taxpayers and our constituents to hear and see the lessons that have been learned through this through this process and through what we've been through this past, you know, what is it, 18, 19 months that we've been through the pandemic. And from this, some benefits that will be truly benefiting our students. So this is amazing. So kudos to our teaching staff and, and to the administrators that have saw that something like this could happen. I think it's great that we're offering these type of benefits and particularly for students who will be going on to trade school and other um, uh, secondary um, offerings that they'll be equipped for a world that already offers these programs. So that's great. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Get your vaccination. Finish the fight. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other quest or questions or comments for 3.01? Okay, next up we have 3.02, BASD Assessment and Grading Committee Update. Well, this will seem like normal educational business for the board. Uh, changes in education in terms of a more robust curriculum, more responsive assessments and new technology tools are making it much easier to determine what a student knows and is able to do against the fixed standard. And these new tools and insights 
stand in contrast with the traditional shopping basket of teacher-specific assignments all averaged together to produce a percentage and then a grade. Two years ago, we convened a committee of middle school and high school teachers, some of our very best, to explore new, more modern mo models of assessment and grading to better support student learning. That group dove into the research in the field and read the works of Dr. Thomas Guskey, the nation's, if not the world's, leading scholar in the field of assessment and grading. We read and discussed the collective research in this book, what we know about grading, what works, what doesn't, and what comes next. And Dr. Guskey even came to the BASD and did full day workshops with the committee and really fired us up as far as the process moving forward. <clears throat> then the pandemic hit a month right after Dr. Guskey was here. <clears throat> but instead of derailing, <clears throat> excuse me, our assessment and grading committee, the heart-wrenching experiences of grading students fairly and accurately during the pan pandemic actually led to a larger embrace for the need of grading reform. This year, we had Dr. Gusky visit again, this time virtually, to do additional workshops for the committee and this time for the secondary administrators. We have established the need to change the way we develop and report student achievement in our middle schools and high schools. So now we're ready for the next book, Get Set, Go, Creating Successful Grading and Reporting Systems and bringing together the assessment and grading committee and members of the secondary administration to develop the comprehensive plan for the next generation of grading and reporting in Bethlehem's middle schools and high schools. Key areas for our work over the next two school years will include continuing having Dr. Gusky and his contracted service grading RX, training our educators and helping us through the change process. Comprehensive surveying of students, teachers, and parents to determine the current knowledge and attitudes towards grading and developing a gap analysis between current practice and best practice. Development of a purpose statement for grading and reporting aligned to standard and best practices and creating new report cards that will report separately academic achievement, A, B, C's, F's, but breaking out student work habits for separate um, indication. We'll also develop separate policies, procedures, and incentives that will make grading and reporting more about improved learning than just traditional sorting and ranking. The Bethlehem Area School District's academic and social emotional recovery plan has earmarked ESSER's fund, grant funds to continue and turbocharge the needed work over the next two years. We'll be in a position to pilot new secondary report cards and recognition systems in the 2022-2023 school year, with an eye on more full transition to a new report card for middle and high schools and a cum laude ranking system in 2023-2024. Now you may be saying to yourself, Jack, you're taking your sweet old time getting to where we need to go. But uh, I will caution you that the effort will require a lot of training, a lot of consensus building, a lot of piloting, and a lot of refinement, which we're ready to do. We will go slow so we can go far. But the pandemic has revealed that it is only a matter of when, not if, schools will be moving to a new form of assessment and grading that aligns to more modern learning. And we're ready to do it the right way. So you'll be seeing some recommendations for that contract service with Dr. Gusky's firm. Uh, I'll keep this as sort of a regular item on future um, curriculum committee updates so that we can see, but it's time to transition grading and assessment from just the way we've always done it because that's the way we know to the way that we really should be doing it because it's the best way. Let me just add, that was great. Uh, Dr. Silva, because, you know, grading is critical on what does it mean? What does a grade mean? We all think if we did wrote down the definition right now, we'd probably all have different definitions. That's a problem. When we have grading systems that, uh, for example, the quick example, if you're averaging, you have two assessments, kid gets a zero and then gets a hundred, you know, two months later, his average is 50. Another student gets a 50 and a 50. He has an average of 50. Who, who, who's the better student? Who's learned more? 
Um, so the issues of how do we assess um, learning and performance assess, uh, against standards is really critical and it, it's a change. And, and places that have changed have found uh, a lot more equity and understanding in their grading, but, it's, but you get a lot of pushback because if it's not what we've always done, then we get pushback, even though we know what we've always done isn't um, the, the best way of tracking student progress. So Dr. Silva has connected with Dr. Gusky, who is if in any category in education that, you know, we could pick, you know, a hundred different categories, the category of grading and assessment, there is one clear recognized authority in the country, and that's Dr. Gusky. So we're really, guy's amazingly accessible, mm -hmm. um, and he will be working with us and his team to guide us through the process to make sure that when a student is assessed, it reflects their uh, performance, what they've learned, and not a bunch of other distractors that might be in there. So that's a long process, um, but we want to get it right. Thank you. Any questions, comments on this? Dr. Silva, I'll just ask you a quick question, and, and I know there's more info to come on this. Has is are there also conversations about class rank and if that's something that would continue or go away? Yes, that uh, the world of academic incentives will come under review as well and moving to a, what they call in the assessment world, the cum laude uh, version of assessment and uh, of class ranking. So the old that there's only going to be one person left standing after all the statistical averaging of the averages together um, that that. Uh, has proven to be, you know, perhaps more harmful than beneficial because there can only be one valedictorian when you decide it that way. But when you have an alternative system, still recognizing the importance of academic achievement, don't get me wrong, but there should be a larger category of students who qualify at the magna, just think of college, like magna cum laude, summa cum laude, will be able to have further and more um, more accurate gradations of student achievement than the current system of, of valedictorians and, and salutatorians. That's wonderful to hear. When I, not to age myself, but when I graduated in 1994, my high school actually got rid of class rank, mm -hmm. which to me then was, you know, looking back was unheard of. And I had a very small graduating class. So to now see us have a graduating classes of six or 700, and like you said, to have that one person standing, that, that's a phenomenal move uh, in, in the right direction, I would say. So thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else with any comments on this? Okay, next up we have agenda items for the May 24th, 2021 regular board meeting. Uh, first, we have 4.01, Title I and Title II non-public school services, Colonial Intermediate Unit 20, agreement amendments. Pretty much as described on the public information there, uh, Mrs. Patrick, uh, these are in accordance with Title I and Title II agreements, and they're uh, presented to the board for its approval. I'm sorry, next up 4.01, Vista Higher Learning, new Spanish curriculum purchase. Muy bien. We have um, one of the better achieved, one of the le lesser known achievements, although I, I think I say this every board curriculum committee meeting, is that over the years we've ha had the curriculum review and revision cycle for our materials, which at one time were pretty aged. But over the last review cycle, five or six years, we've been able to, in all the core subjects, math, science, social studies, and English, now it's study sync. And now uh, with the uh, largest elective, which is Spanish, which is by far the largest world language and the largest elective area, upgrading the uh, educational materials and the curriculum uh, that really was really required. Um, these are very, uh, Vista Higher Learning was the result of a comparison of different products in the industry. Uh, we had a team of uh, teachers look at it, compare uh, presentations by different vendors, and look for things like uh, technological adaptability, uh, 
different grade levels or reading levels, the ability to transition back and forth into the native language, how much it applies to native speakers. And one of the nice things in, uh, with Vista Learning and every other new digital product, especially when all of our students possess a Chromebook, is the audio now is a real game changer. So in an area like Spanish, where a lot of the a lot of the learning happens when you're hearing and reciting and repeating and changing the pace and the timbre and everything about learning how to pronounce pronounce words in Spanish. Uh, th this uh, curriculum is a rocket ship in those areas. So whether it's tele technological innovation, the quality of the programming, or you know the, the content and the adaptability to all types of students, native speaking or uh, new Spanish speakers. Uh, our uh, recommendation is that we uh, enter into contract with Vista Higher Learning and their product is like every other product these days, you buy a license for six or seven years, you use the consumables and um, we will expect to see uh, quite a uh, higher level of engagement and success in Spanish because we, we, we really need these new materials. Gracias. Does anyone have any questions or comments on this item? Okay, seeing none, next up we have courtesy of the floor for any item. For those at home, feel free to hop on to Zoom, the Q&A, type in a question or raise your hand. We don't see anything at this time. So next up, uh, open forum, Mr. Alozzi. Um, Dr. Roy or Dr. Silva, I don't know um, if you're looking to do this for our next a uh, full board meeting, but I would love to know how we're doing. I know we talked a little bit just now in terms of numbers, but I remember when we were talking a month ago about opening school, there was a lot of trepidation and hesitation and concern with space and layouts and things of that. How have we navigated that? How people responded and how is that going at the moment? Great question. Thank you. Um, it's gone well at the, you know, the, we're talking about the elementary level, um, when very smoothly people have figured out their new routines. Um, in the cases when we've had a, a student who was positive and who was in school, we have more close contact. So, you know, we go by the desk, now we go the six feet. So instead of just one person, it's going to be two people, for example. So we've had, in those cases, we've had more close contacts, but those close contacts haven't then become positive. And so the more the cases go down, the less that issue goes away. But we knew that would be the challenge. If, you, if you're within six feet, then you're going to be a close contact of somebody. Uh, beyond that, they're figuring out the, the cafeterias and so forth. Um, so really, it's gone, gone, you know, just like the beginning of the year, surprisingly uh, well. Um, I, I did want to mention, too, it reminded me that we had over over 200, I, um, we were still vaccinating until six o'clock. So uh, between the Liberty and Freedom locations, we had over a couple hundred people be vaccinated. Um, and that included parents too. Um, so it wasn't just students, but my theory is anybody in the community uh, gets vaccinated, it's helpful. Um, I was told there were some parents that came in just to kind of check it out and said, all right, looks, you know, my kid's getting it, all right, I'll get it. Um, so that's that's good, and we'll do that again. And if the did I hear Dr. So is is uh, is it down to twelve now for emergency? Uh, yeah, CDC okay. yeah. that was announced today. I, I hadn't seen that. Um, so now we'll look at doing a middle middle a twelve and up clinic uh, with the health department. Again, the health department continues to be a fantastic uh, partner. Also, when sports physicals are done in June, uh, St. Luke's will be setting up to provide vaccines as well. So any way we can um, help get the community vaccinated. I think for some people going to your school is more comfortable than going to Wind Creek or going mm -hmm. to some other a clinic somewhere. So um, so if this works, we'll, we'll partner to do more. That's great news. Anyone else for open forum? Okay. Seeing nothing else, may I have a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mrs. Schenkel. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Shively. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.